So we're talking about biomass for energy today. And there's no way you can get sleepy because I'm going to wear this all class today. So, Guys, got to tell me what my costume is. The carbon footprint. Yeah, so this costume was um, made by our former colleague, Carl Knapp, which we'll hear more about when we talk about transportation. So why would I wear it for today? This is the reason that we try to do biomass, is people claim it has a low carbon footprint. But I think as you'll see with a lot of the sources we talk about today, that is certainly not, often not the case. Um, and so we'll talk about what it means and what is what actually is the carbon footprint of different ways that we use biomass. All right, I love this cartoon. Uh, I'm a big Gary Larson fan anyway, so far side. I've introduced it to my kids and now they quote it all the time, which just makes me happy. Um, but you know, this is just, um, you know, they're, they're sitting on the, the tree working in timber and they're talking about how great it is in outdoors and working outside. Um, so today we're going to talk about energy from biomass. The big themes I want you to get from today is complex and diverse. Biomass means a whole bunch of different things. And so you can't just, just kind of paint it with, with one brush in terms of is it carbon neutral, is it carbon not neutral? It really depends on what you're talking about. So it's really diver diverse on the resource size and it's really diverse on the use side. Um, we can use it for all sorts of things. We can use it for heat, for electricity, for, you know, as a gas, as a solid, for transportation as a liquid. We can um, use it to replace oil and things that are like, um, more like lubricants or plastics. Uh, it's, it's a hydrocarbon, right? So it is, instead of ancient biomass, it's today biomass. And so just to get you thinking, it's complex and diverse kind of in a lot of different dimensions. Um, some of the good things, you know, it's available, it's fairly easy to store, not as easy as our fossil fuels, because you do have to worry about, like if you're storing wood, you won't have to worry about rot and bugs and things like that, but fairly easy to store. Opportunity for waste, renewable-ish, so we'll talk more about that today. Um, very diverse, can replace fossil fuels, because again, it's a hydrocarbon, um, and in some of the ways we use it, we can, we can have useful byproducts as well. Bad is pretty extensive, which some of you brought up. Um, air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions are things we worry about. Land use impacts biodiversity, it impacts soil, it impacts competition with food. Um, so the, the land use requirements tend to be large, so those are all things we worry about in terms of land, as well as fertilizer and water use. So those are things that we have to worry about with a lot of our biomass. Um, just to note, the last one I listed on there, if you're burning biomass in, a, in a, a thermal power plant instead of like coal or something, it's not as energy dense. And that makes sense, right? Coal is like 20 meters of, of biomass squished into a meter of coal. You've squished all that biomass. Biomass today, the, you know, just getting the wood, it's, it's less energy dense. And so you tend to have a less efficient thermal power plant when you start burning biomass. It's got a lower heat. And so remember from Carnot, we care about our tea hot being really hot and our tea cold being really cold to make it more efficient. Biomass is gonna lower your efficiency. Um, we're not gonna talk a lot about that today, but it's just a minor note. Um, and like I said, complex and diverse is what I want you to get from today. And as we know, in our renewable energy categories, biomass falls into this, what we categorize as semi-renewable. Um, depending on what kind of biomass you're talking about. But much of it is only renewable if it's carefully managed. And I would say that we have a poorer track record of carefully managing our biomass and doing it in a sustainable manner. And so that's where it really becomes a challenge. There are two broad categories of biomass, just to get you thinking, um, traditional and commercial. So traditional is what we were talking about in the developing world. Much of the world still depends on traditional biomass, You know, 2.8 billion people are collecting it for themselves and using it for cooking, heating, and lighting. That's traditional biomass. In a lot of the charts, a lot of the um, data, traditional biomass isn't included. It's not, it's not easily tracked um, because it's not bought and sold. And we tend to really only care about quantities once we're buying and selling it. Um, so it's, it's not often included. Today, we're mostly gonna be talking about commercial biomass. It's also called modern biomass. Modern bioenergy, those are all kind of meaning the same kind of things, biomass for energy. Um, those are things that are bought and sold commercially. Um, and like I said, much, much more easily tracked. 
Those things come in three kind of main flavors. The solid biomass, which is what I think of as the resource, because that's what exists, is we have the solid biomass. We can make that solid biomass into a liquid, and that's what we're doing for our transportation. So we're making it, we have to do more to it to make it into our transportation fluid. We can also make it into a gas and use it for anything natural gas is used for. Right? So it can be a replacement for natural gas if we make biogas. So I'm gonna talk about the significance and start in the big picture, significant use of biomass, and then we'll talk more about commercial solid biomass. Okay, so big picture. Um, this is a great resource when we're looking at um, information for renewables. So REN21 is an organization that puts out a global status report every year on all renewables, and it's a great resource. This is one of their charts. You can see they, they include both traditional and modern bioenergy, as they're calling it, um, and it's about 12% of total final energy consumption. So on the data, and when you're, when you're thinking about it, think about the energy system, you can take the kind of the energy slice at different points in that energy system. When they talk total final energy consumption, that's at the services side. So it's kind of like after you've had all the upstream losses. So of total final energy consumption, which is where traditional biomass is used, right? It's right at the service. It's about 12% in terms of biomass. And you can see it's got a pretty diverse uh, set of uses. Heat, transportation, heat for both buildings and industry, um, traditional biomass a lot in, in heat for buildings and, and cooking as well. So what is the biomass resource? There's a whole bunch, but you can think it's just, it's things that come from plant and animals generally, and then also our waste streams are all lumped together and considered biomass. So things that makes, you know, that come to mind, wood and energy crops, agriculture, when they have residues, that can be a biomass resource. Sometimes they burn it for heat or they, they burn it for electricity production. Animal wastes, aquatic biomass, those are all kind of traditional, what you would think of as a biomass resource, but also our municipal solid waste, our landfill gas, tires, these are all considered a uh, part of the biomass resource. And so when you see data about biomass, you have to think kind of holistically, all of those waste streams are, are included. Sun is ultimately the energy resource that is providing uh, most of this biomass. And so I just kind of put a little fun fact on here and how efficient are plants at capturing solar energy? About three to 6% efficient. All right, so what is the biomass that is predominantly used in the world? Most of it is solid biomass, so that's the, the wood and crops and things like that. Um, you can see waste streams as a bioenergy resource. It's only about 5% of our total biomass. And then our liquids, that's mostly going to transportation and then biogas, we'll talk about its diverse, diverse uses. But much of the biomass that is used worldwide is solid biomass. Let's look at the, the different categories it's used. So this is looking at bioenergy for heating. It's not really a growing um, area in terms of um, demand for bioenergy use for like heating, and that includes industry and buildings. And so you can see it's kind of got modest growth, um, but not a lot going on in the bioenergy for, for heating category. Biomass for electricity is growing, um, certainly, a lot of growth in China, but also some growth in Europe, which we'll talk more about. And you got a video about Europe growing their biomass electricity generation. So this is just some statistics showing you. It's, it's again, um, it's growing. China, as we've talked about, is kind of growing all of the above and trying to meet their, their energy demand. Just introducing another term, global biomass for electricity, sometimes called biopower, um, is, it also uses diverse types of biofuels. So it's using those solid wood and forestry products like we'll see with, with Europe. Agriculture residues, a lot of that is in Brazil. So Brazil produces a lot of sugar cane. They have a leftover material called bagasse. And bagasse is burned often on site for both heat and electricity production. Municipal solid waste, which we'll talk more about, you can burn it directly. Um, you can also make some of our waste into biogas and that's used for electricity production as well. But you can see the feedstocks for global electricity um, really is dominated by those, those solid biomass products. All right, bringing it home to the US, 
This is what our total primary energy consumption looks like in the United States. Um, and those tiny little wedges at the top are our biomass. It's only about 5% of our total primary energy consumption. To zoom in on just the renewable wedge, those top little uh, pieces of our energy mix, um, you can see biomass is, is about 40% of our, our renewable energy. It used to be closer to half, but as wind and solar have, have really grown, um, it's shrunk down to about 40%. You can see that wood really use as a bioenergy resource in the US isn't really growing, it's playing pretty stagnant. Um, same is pretty true with waste streams, but most of the growth we've seen is in biofuels, which we'll talk more about today. That biomass is used in all sorts of different energy sectors in the US. So this is just giving you a sense of where in the US are we using that biomass. Wood is primarily gonna be used for heat and Electric power, so you can see that's, that's where those, those sectors dominate. And the biofuels are, are pretty much all used in transportation. It's the only place where it's really worth taking that extra effort to make it a liquid fuel is for the transportation sector where you're carrying your fuel around. Otherwise, it's much better to just use it as a, a primary bio, biomass resource. So how do we categorize biomass and how much do we have? This is just giving an estimate based on one study that looked at the United States and said, okay, if we made use of all of our biomass resource that we have in the US, taking into account places we can't use the biomass and that kind of stuff, how much could it really supply of our energy mix? And this estimate was the potential is only about 8% of our annual energy consumption. Um, this is just to say that we can't we can't like replace all of our gasoline use with a biofuel, for example. Um, the demand has to come way down. We can't just replace one for the other um, with domestically supplied biomass. The other thing I wanted to point out is how is it categorized and what is that heat content? So you can see the heat content for average biomass. This is pretty much based on wood. is much lower than our fossil fuels. And it really matters whether it's dry or wet. And so when you're burning your biomass, you really want it to be dry. Otherwise, that, that, that water really is gonna soak up a lot of the heat that you're trying to use for whatever heat or electricity use you wanna use it for. Bringing it closer to home in California, we do have um, biomass power plants in California. Um, a lot of them are waste to energy. So even the ones that are using wood, it is wood waste that are powering our biomass power plants in California. Provides about 3% of our in-state electricity production. Um, and you can see just kind of how, how we compare to some other major states that have biomass electricity generation. Um, we're, we're right there at the top in terms of biomass for electricity here in California. All right, let's talk about commercial biomass. So I mentioned that in Brazil, which produces a lot of sugar cane, they have a byproduct called bagasse. Um, and so that can be used to produce heat and Electricity. So this is just a picture of a bagasse co-fired or bagasse-fired cogeneration plant in Brazil. So cogeneration, heat, and electricity. Um, this is a more modern use of the bagasse. The bagasse is just is just like a waste. They have to get rid of it, and so it used to be much more the practice, and still is in some places, to just burn the fields um, to get rid of the bagasse and get it ready for the sugarcane planting, and so. Obviously a better use of that agricultural resource is to gather it and um, use it for a cogeneration plant than burning it out in the fields and, and not capturing at least the energy from, from burning that agricultural waste. So this is, I guess, progress that has been made in terms of sugarcane um, in Brazil. Okay, so let's start with solid biomass. Let's talk about wood and wood waste. So. Half of the forest harvest in the world is for energy, and that's actually growing. Um, so I don't have the latest statistics on it, but it is a growing source of energy, um, as, as we'll talk about with Europe in particular. The main uses, you know, it's for heating and electric power generation. The categories when we talk about our wood and our wood waste is the actual wood that you're cutting down. You can also have residues. So um, a lot of the lumber places or paper mills in particular, 
they will use their byproducts to produce heat. And so again, it's like this on-site, I have this waste stream, I can burn it for heat that I need in my facility. So much of it, the, the black liqueur and the, the fuel wood and wood residues, those can be used like in, like in, in the paper mill itself. Charcoal is a, another category, and what you're doing with charcoal is you're overheating the wood and then you're using it um, for, for cooking. Um, and so making it into charcoal basically makes that wood last longer. It makes it so it is, it is more resistant to bugs and water and things like that, so it's, it's a little easier to sell as a, um, as a home use um, product from, from your wood. The sources of this wood can be all sorts of things. You know, we log natural woodlands, we log managed forests, we log fuel wood plantations. The dependence of our energy system on wood in the US has been declining. So basically what that means is our, our wood use has stayed pretty constant, but our energy use has grown overall. And so wood is not growing domestically as a use, but as you'll see, we are exporting a lot of wood to other countries where it is growing. So the US is actually the largest producer and exporter of wood pellets. Um, and those wood pellets are being used more and more in Europe to power power plants um, as part of their effort to turn more to renewables um, and reduce their dependence on fossil fuels. So where it, the wood is coming from, so this, this chart on your left is showing where the wood is. So much of the western part of the United States, it's in public forest. In the southeast, it's really private lands. A lot of private lands, a lot of forested private lands in the southeast. And that's where, where the logging is taking place. So that chart on the right is showing where the biomass energy is concentrated. And you can see a lot of it's concentrated on those private lands in the southeast, um, where those places are being deforested uh, to provide the wood pellets um, a lot of which are, are going to Europe. So what does that look like? So this, this is just a few charts showing um, how the pellet sales are increasing over time in terms of exports from the US. And then, you know, kind of what Europe's biomass energy production looks like. And so you can see biomass is really a growing portion of their renewable energy mix. Um, and like it says, about two thirds of their biomass comes from the US. There's two main players in this, Drax Group and Inviva. Um, I believe Inviva was the one that was mentioned in the video. Um, Inviva is the world's largest biomass pellet producer. Um, if you go to their website, not to pick on Inviva too much, but here's, here's what it says on the website, to place coal, grow more trees, fight climate change. Why might this be a little bit um, misleading? Yeah, you're cutting, you're cutting down the trees and you're replacing them later with trees, but often, as you saw in the video, not with the same trees. And the biggest challenge, if you're just thinking about climate change, which we can talk about all the other land use problems, the biggest use if you're just talking about climate change is the time scale. And so a lot of studies have shown that when you cut down a tree, it can take a decade to a century to replace that tree with a new tree that's restored the carbon that you just burned and emitted immediately. And when you're talking about climate change, while that carbon is in the atmosphere, whether it's a decade or 100 years, it is contributing to climate change. And so the time scale matters. It matters that we're cutting down a tree today and we can't restore that carbon for a decade or more. We've contributed to climate change during that time. And so this is, even from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint, this is a problem where biomass doesn't meet that carbon neutrality that they're talking about because it takes so long to get, if we get that carbon back in. Um, you also, when you're, re, when, these are all, you know, natural forests. So you have the land use, the, the ecosystem impacts, um, air pollution, water pollution, and also what are you replacing? You lose that biodiversity in terms of what are you replacing the trees with, even if you're growing new trees. And so you tend to make it more of a monolithic forest rather than the diversity that it used to have. And so all of those impacts, as well as, as you saw in the video, the impacts on local communities. So the EU has had a lot of, gotten a lot of pressure from this. There's been a lot of studies, um, a lot of pushback on counting this as a renewable resource. 
Um, the latest time it came up was, was last fall in September, but they've continued to classify it as a renewable resource. Um, I would expect they would con they're gonna continue to get a lot of pressure about this because studies again and again have shown it's not really renewable or necessarily good for the climate um, to use biomass. All right, so what do fuel wood plantations look like? So this is more like an energy crop rather than taking it from natural forests. You've taken land and made it into a fuel wood plantation. You tend to use very fast growing trees. So again, it's not the same thing as a forest when you're doing a fuel wood plantation or really any other farm, right? It's just a different kind of farm. Um, and again, it's not carbon neutral. You're still not replacing it as quickly as you're burning. The, the trees and releasing the carbon. All right, so just kind of to summarize some of the things for woody biomass, um, a lot of these things I think are pretty obvious, so I don't need to, to lead you through them. Um, it is both greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution that you worry about, um, as well as kind of the, the other um, impacts we've talked about. One of the solutions that comes up for um, greenhouse gas emissions from electricity, right, is carbon capture and storage. And so a lot of times, the one of the ways that is pointed to is bioenergy and using carbon capture and storage. So thinking about that you're also, you're sequestering the carbon both by growing the, the resource and after you've burned it and um, the power plant. Um, again, it's, it's still a challenge, and you guys have seen a lot about the carbon capture challenge in terms of cost and what are the alternatives? What are the other options we have um, in terms of how do we get the electricity and the services we need um, instead of some of these more land use and water and fertilizer heavy options? But it certainly is an option that is being investigated. All right, let's talk about um, am farm animals for a bit. So. Obviously, there's different ways that we have and different types of animals we have on farms or ranches. And that can impact a lot on um, what the environmental impacts are. So I have a little pictures of some of our common farm animals, cows, pigs, and chickens. Um, and the land they use can be very different. So you saw in the video, um, cow, the cow power video, that was a dairy. Right? And so when the dairy cows, we bring them all together, we milking them regularly, it tends to be a pretty, they're, they're kind of contained in a pretty small footprint. Whereas a lot of ranching, meat ranching, things like that, the cows are, are going pretty far afield. And so just thinking about that in terms of can we use their manure as a biomass resource, it really is more challenging on like a meat ranch than something like a dairy farm, for example. So just keeping that in mind. They not only contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, which we've talked a little bit about when we talked about methane, um, but they also contribute to air pollution. Um, and so California alone has, has some problems from smog, a lot of it from um, some of the dairy farms, especially in, in the Central Valley. Um, and so there are air pollution regulations and using that manure as an energy resource helps produce helps reduce the local air pollution in addition to greenhouse gas emissions. So just thinking about those co-benefits we can get if it's the type of facility where we can do some of these uh, biomass to energy options. So looking at greenhouse gas emissions from farm animals, somewhere between 1%, around 1% of US and about 5% of world greenhouse gas emissions are from, from domestically raised farm animals. Um, and so it's, you've seen this chart before in terms of methane emissions in the US, got both from the manure and from the, primarily the burping of, of cows reducing methane. So using their manure for energy production, like I said, can both produce energy so we can offset fossil fuels and also reduce air pollution, reduce methane, reduce greenhouse gases at the same time. So it's kind of a win-win if we're able to do it. Um, the video, I think, talks about the challenges economics. The challenges doing this um, in a way that the, the ranch or the farm can afford it. And so the example that you saw and that we visit sometimes on a field trip, um, they have to have partnerships with the state, with federal, 
getting grants, all these kind of things to be able to afford the system that allows them to do this, this manure to energy production, even though it has all these co-benefits. And so the economics is really the, the main barrier and challenge for this. So how do you do it? Um, how do we make biogas from animal waste? You can do it at a big scale, like they were showing for the dairy farm. You can also do it at a small scale, rural scale. You can even do it at a household scale. Um, so I'm gonna just show you, these are just some examples more in the, um, in the developing world where you can make a cleaner burning fuel by making that solid biomass into a gas rather than burning it directly. And that has human health benefits um, as well as just having a higher quality uh, fuel for cooking for example. So the way it works is you have to do it anaerobically. You have, to, you have to be digesting this stuff without oxygen. What do we want out of our biodigester? What chemical do we want? Methane, right? We want biogas, we want our methane. We want that to be our, our energy resource from our digester. If the oxygen's in there, it's, it's gonna go to CO2. It's gonna oxidize that and we're not gonna get methane out, we'll get CO2 out. And so it's really important that it's anaerobic and we don't have oxygen in our biodigester. We don't want it oxidized until we're burning it and using it as our fuel. Okay, so biogas um, is obviously dominated by methane after um, you're pulling it out of your anaerobic digester. Um, it does have other things in it, it's really hard to get all of the oxygen out of there. And so the energy contents tends to be a little bit lower than natural gas, so you know, 600 to 700 BTUs per cubic feet. Natural gas is more like 1,000. Kind of goes with the ratio of how much methane is in there. You also, once you digest the stuff um, and you get that methane off, you also get, get byproducts that you can use as fertilizer. Sometimes they use it as, as fish food. There's other things you can do with that um, solid that comes out and tends to smell a lot less and stuff after you've, after you've done it, gone through the, the digester. So this is what it looks like when it's like a rural digester. So again, talking about more like um, in the developing world, something that they put underground, you have an inlet, you're putting your, your um, manure and things like that in there. You have this overflow tank that's basically maintaining pressure to try to keep the oxygen out of there. And so then the, the natural gas can, let's see if this works, natural gas can, can um, kind of accumulate in this area, and this is keeping pressure on your tank so that you keep oxygen out of there. And then you can pull the biogas off, off the top. Commercial scale manure digesters, there's kind of three main types. You guys saw this, this one on the right in the video, the complete mixer over here. You can also do some more simple designs. The covered lagoon digester is one of them, and that's just basically what it sounds like. He's standing on top of it. Um, you have a lagoon of manure and water usually, and you put a big plastic sheet over it, and you just let it digest, and you pull the, the gas off of it. Um, and you usually have different ponds where you're rotating. So it's, it's kind of batch process where you're rotating to different lagoons. You can also do a horizontal plug flow digester, which really is, is the, the manure flows through the tubes. And so by the time it gets to the end, you've pretty much digested all of it and you've gotten all the natural gas out and you have your product coming out. So in the US, we, we kind of have all of these. We have plug flow, we have complete mixers, and we have covered lagoons. Those are the three main types that we use in the US. Uh, just to give you a sense of how much energy you can get out. Um, this is just kind of a rule of thumb that a cow can provide about 100 watts. And so if you want a megawatt, you're gonna have, have 10,000 cows. Just to give you a sense of scale. So these tend to be pretty small systems um, when you're doing like biogas to electricity production, for example. We do have quite a few of them in the US. So in 2019, we had over 250 operating digesters um, providing electricity production, um, enough to power about 120,000 homes. Um, but there's a lot more potential. Um, you can see the potential up here. It says, you know, 8,000 dairy and hog operations. Um, and so those are just the easy to collect ones. This doesn't, they don't include the ranches for meat as potential because it's, it's just too challenging to collect that manure. 
All right, any questions about animals before we move on to other waste forms? What does the future of biomass look like as the movement to free range animals from farms is growing? Yeah, that's a great question um, in terms of like how dense they are. It is obviously a lot harder to use their waste streams um, as a energy resource if they're free range. So that, and that's true for chickens to hogs to um, cows. Uh, dairy is, is pretty much, I think, the only one where that is always going to be pretty easy because you do bring the cows together to milk them. Um, but again, in sense of scale and, and economics, it's the, the bigger commercial places are going to have easier economics than some of the smaller farms. And so I think there will be, you know, if, if we continue on a trend where we have less factory farms and more of those, we would have harder opportunity to use them for this type of energy. Um, and so I guess their poop and stuff would just be fertilizing wherever they are. Yeah, it's a great, great question. Okay, let's talk about our municipal solid waste for a few minutes. Um, so globally, we have about 2 million metric tons of municipal solid waste per year, 2 billion, excuse me, metric tons of MSW per year, a lot. Um, and the waste sector is estimated to contribute to about 20% of global anthropogenic methane emissions. So this is a big, a big portion, a big deal. Landfill gas is a big challenge with that. Um, as we take our municipal solid waste, right, that's our garbage, and we go and bury it in the landfill, you're basically putting it into an anaerobic digester. The landfill is a place that doesn't have oxygen. It's gonna create methane inside the landfill. And then that land, that methane is either leaking or being vented or sometimes being flared coming out of, of the landfill. Um, part of the, the effort, and you'll, we'll see what we've done here in the US, is to capture that methane and use it for electricity production, which we do here actually over in um, Half Moon Bay. We have a, they have a small landfill uh, electricity generation power plant there. But you want to make the, a use of that, or at least burn it, right, instead of just venting methane. Um, but it is still a major source of methane emissions uh, globally. So what does our municipal solid waste look like? This is what it looks like uh, here in the US in terms of the mix of things. Uh, you can see a lot of paper and paperboard, plastic, yard trimmings, food, a lot of stuff that can be burned for energy. Um, we produce a lot of trash in the US, so four and a half pounds of trash every day per person. To give you a sense of the energy content of our trash, this is just a little estimate, um, that about 2,000 pounds of garbage is about the same as energy content of 500 pounds of coal. So pretty energy dense in terms of what we're throwing away. A lot of it is, is biomass and you know, plastics are, are basically other hydrocarbons. So, a lot of things that we could be using as an energy resource. What do we do with it? Most of it goes to landfill. You can see, and again, this is for the US, you can see we do combust some of our municipal solid waste for energy recovery. In particular places that are kind of running out of landfill space, they have incinerators where they burn it and uh, produce electricity. We do some composting for some of it, for some of our waste, uh, recycle a portion of it, but you can see neither of those are growing uh, very quickly. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity in both recycling and composting, I would say, for our waste. So one study looked at you know, how much of our municipal solid waste could be composted, about half of it. Um, the, the benefit you get in composting, right, is that you're not putting it into your biodigester and then your landfill biodigester and then getting methane leaking off of it. So when you're composting that food, you're doing it aerobically. So that is not turning into methane, it's turning into CO2, which is less potent. And a lot of that carbon actually gets captured or sequestered in that compost that you can then use for, for planting and for farming and things like that. So composting is a much better use of these um, wood scraps, food scraps, paperboard, than sending them into the landfill for 
other reasons, but for, for those uh, greenhouse gas reasons too. So when you're composting, it's like an aerobic digester. But a lot of that carbon actually gets sequestered too. Yeah. Does that mean that you can create energy aerobically? No, because uh, you've already oxidized it. So you could theoretically take these same uh, food scraps and things like that and put it in an anaerobic digester. And if it's anaerobic, then you could take the methane off of it and burn it for energy. And then you would still have the, the byproduct be like basically dirt and things that you could use for agriculture or soil or things like that. So what are the, the basic approaches for waste to energy conversion? There's three ways we can do it. We can burn it um, just as a solid waste. We can turn it into a gas, which is what we're doing kind of in the landfills. There's other ways to turn it into gas, but it's also, we could do a gasification, which is not something we do commercially, but has been looked at as on the pilot uh, project phase for a long time. Uh, gasification has been looked at. Um, I would say there's kind of renewed interest in it uh, given the urgency of, of climate change. So let's go through each of these. So in terms of just burning it directly, um, just think about it as, as a thermal power plant where instead of burning your coal, you're burning the municipal solid waste. Uh, the challenge, the biggest challenge with this is the air pollution. That municipal solid waste contains all sorts of things that you don't necessarily want to be burning and then releasing. And so a lot of times these incinerators actually have to have a waiver for local air pollution laws in order to be able to run. And we see that um, in a lot of the, the states. You can see there's, there's quite a few down in Florida. Um, they, they have to get a waiver because they don't meet air pollution regulations. Um, there's a lot of dioxins and other things that once you start burning those, those chlorines and things that are in like the plastics, it's really bad for air pollution and human health. You also, kind of like coal, end up with kind of a toxic sludge afterwards. So it's, you don't fully get rid of that, that waste. You still have some that has to go to landfill. And now that you've burned it, it's often um, a toxic waste that has to be dealt with. Tires, which I said are considered a biomass, a lot of those are burned um, as a fuel. Uh, tires are, again, mostly hydrocarbons. Um, but you still have air pollution concerns when you start burning tires as well. Looking at what, where in the world we do municipal solid waste burning for energy recovery, um, Scandinavia and Japan kind of lead on that. Um, places like Japan, it kind of makes sense, right? If you're land limited, you're trying to reduce your waste streams as much as possible. And so one of the ways you can do that is, is burning your municipal solid waste. Okay, the next way you can do it is by taking that landfill gas and using it uh, to produce energy and produce electricity, right? This is, I think, an area, because of its already impact on greenhouse gas emissions, we're releasing a lot of methane from landfills. This is an area where um, I think there needs to be a lot of growth. There's a lot of opportunity here. The challenge that you have with landfills is that oftentimes you are, you know, you're filling it and you're burying it, you're filling it and burying it, and then your landfill at some point will be full and you'll bury it and your fuel source is done. And so you only have a certain amount of time, you know, a decade, two decades, to draw natural gas from that landfill. It depends on the size of the landfill and, and how you're managing it. Um, so it, you have to have something that drives investment into that power plant, even knowing that you don't, may not have a long-term steady resource at that landfill, if that makes sense. So that can be a challenge for capturing it for energy purposes. So what does that look like? This is just showing you a little example um, where they have the landfill here. And you can see this is an active landfill. They're still burying it, but the parts they've already buried, they have pipes that they've laid in there, and they're collecting the methane to go to the power plant and um, run just a traditional steam cycle power plant. You can see in terms of how do we use our landfill gas when we do capture it, primarily for electricity, but you can also use it for direct use for heat. Um, and in some places where it's allowed, you can put a certain percentage into pipelines. If you've cleaned it up, it can just be a direct replacement for natural gas in, in our pipelines. Again, it's primary methane, so if you pull out any of the CO2 or other impurities, you can just put it into the natural gas um, pipeline as a renewable gas. 
Where is that happening in the world, or in the US, sorry, in the US? You can see this, this chart is showing you where there's operational projects and where there are candidate landfills. In other words, um, the government did a survey and said, could we do landfill gas to energy production at this landfill? They surveyed that, and you can see about half, a little over half, of the ones that are, are candidate could be used. So we have about 560 operational, about 475 could be doing um, methane to energy um, projects. And this just gives you a sense of the operational ones, the ones that are completed. Again, once there will be a point if, you sh if you're done with the landfill, we run out of the, the landfill gas. Um, and then this is just, they were estimating how many methane and CO2 emission reductions were done because of the operating, operating plant. So you are reducing the amount of methane that's going and you're making a useful, making use of it as an energy resource. Okay, the third way we can deal with our waste is gasification. Um, and so there's a video about it if you wanna know more about it, but basically you're, you're heating up the garbage in an anaerobic environment and making it into a syngas, which is a synthetic uh, natural gas. Uh, again, it's a natural gas and then you can use that natural gas in all sorts of different ways, just like you can um, regular natural gas. Um, like I said, it has been a, a challenge to do this in, at scale and economically, but you saw, you can see in the video, there's um, definitely some, some companies that are trying. Much cleaner to burn gas from our waste than it is to burn the solid directly. Um, because once you gasify it, you've kind of left the impurities behind and you're not burning them. All right, and then we can do digesters for our, our human waste as well, so sewage waste. Um, and this is one way, if you're, if you're digesting it, you're getting a methane off of it as an energy resource and you're cleaning up the sewage at the same time um, by digesting it. So this is just an example on an um, East, East Bay Municipal uh, Utility District, which we call um, East Bay Mud um, in Oakland where they're doing a biodigester on human waste. Um, and then using that energy to produce electricity. Locally, some of you got to go see it. Um, we have our own uh, little um, wastewater treatment plant, Kodaga, where they're doing all sorts of research on how to use human waste for environmental and energy um, production uses. So um, I encourage you to check that out if you're interested in this area. Any questions? Yeah. With agricultural waste, is it possible with gasification methods to trap what would otherwise be methane released into the environment? So it depends on what you're talking about. So the agricultural waste, a lot of them are burned. So they're not generally left to rot where they would produce methane. Um, they're generally burned. Um, you could use them in a digester where, again, it's anaerobic, so that then you would be um, capturing you know, methane to use. Even if you just leave something to rot, it's gonna produce CO2, just like composting, versus methane. And so you're not releasing methane emissions unless it's a landfill where you're kind of capturing it away from oxygen. Yeah. Is burning agricultural waste making a difference or is it just a less harmful solution? Yeah, so it really depends on the, the residue you're talking about um, and what, what you're doing with it. Um, because some of them, it can be better to just, you just till it back into the soil. Um, it's not gonna produce methane, but you can sequester some of the carbon that way. Um, certainly, if you're going to burn it, it's better to burn it and use it for energy than just burn it and release that CO2. Um, but it's not a major source of methane from crop residues because they're either being digested aerobically in the air and they're producing CO2, um, or they're being burned, which produces CO2. They're not generally producing methane. Unlike when we put it in a landfill, now it's anaerobic, now it's producing methane. But certainly there's an opportunity to use it. Why can't you use CO2 to burn it as a gas for energy, but you can use methane? So when you burn something, CO2 is the product you get. CO2 doesn't burn, you're oxidizing a hydrocarbon. Um, so you have to have the hydrocarbon, like the CH4, which is methane, or you know, other more complex hydrocarbons. But the carbon-hydrogen bond, when you're burning it, you're taking oxygen from the air, you're oxidizing it, and creating CO2. So CO2 is like the product, you're done. Um, 
there isn't like you, you can't oxidize it further to get energy out of it. So it's kind of like the end product. Okay, the final thing I'm gonna leave you with, I just have a summary slide. If we can do things with waste streams, uh, especially if we're, they're gaseous, if we can do gaseous waste streams, it's gonna be beneficial from a greenhouse gas emissions and an air pollution standpoint. Solid waste, you really have to worry about the air pollution um, if you're burning it directly. And there's probably other ways we can reduce our solid waste, like composting half of it here in the US. Thank you guys for your attention.